So you survived the war that was nurse practitioner school, congratulations. Now you've landed your dream job and you sit and wait in fear for the next question to arise from a nurse, from a patient sitting across from you and you think, what if I don't know the answer? Am I even qualified to answer these questions? What if I make a mistake? This kind of negative internal dialogue is just plaguing you constantly and it's exhausting. The obvious question is, when is this gonna get better? When am I gonna feel confident in this role? This, my friends, is what we call imposter syndrome. And it was one of the most challenging aspects of becoming a nurse practitioner for me. It's not that I didn't anticipate it would be a challenge, but I definitely underestimated how severe it would be. And since I've been in practice, almost every single new person that I've seen on board has gone through it in their own fashion. Some have it more severe than others, but almost everyone goes through it. So the same scenario of just like underestimating how bad it's gonna be, the challenge of it, staying late at work, suffering this imposter syndrome to the point of feeling like, I don't feel like I'm qualified to do this and I think I'm afraid I can't hack it. I'm gonna to have to quit. I think part of the problem is that we just don't talk about this enough as a profession. We're not very transparent, so we don't know to anticipate how severe it's gonna be. So in this video, I'm gonna rectify this shortcoming and we're gonna talk all about imposter syndrome, what it is, how you know if you have it. I'm gonna answer for you the most commonly asked question that I always get when I have a student or a new grad with me, and that is, when did I feel competent and confident in this role? And then I'm gonna tell you a couple of things I wish I had done differently in hindsight. If we haven't met yet, my name is Bree. I'm a critical care nurse practitioner, educator, mentor, and interview strategist. Welcome to the channel. Any of the videos or references that I discuss or suggest will be linked in the description below. Okay, what is it? Imposter syndrome is basically a feeling of inadequacy. It's the inability to believe that your success is deserved or has been legitimately achieved as a result of the effort and skills that you've put into it. Wikipedia describes this as something experienced by someone who may think they are deceiving others. And this to me is the root of it all because honestly it boils down to a lack of confidence. I'm afraid that I don't have the chops to do this job even though I've completed training and am in the process of orienting to this new role. These type of fears are reported more in females and those in positions of power, particularly those whose decisions are high stakes. According to a KPMG study of female C-suite executives, 75% of them experience imposter syndrome. I'll link the study below if you wanna read more about that. Most all professions pose challenges during the orientation process that make life kinda of difficult in the early days. But the higher the stakes the, of the environment, like those dealing with human lives, the bar is just raised even further on the degree of insecurity and the feelings of overwhelm. I find most new grads know that this is a hurdle, but have underestimated how bad it's gonna be and how long it's gonna take to get over this challenge. I believe as new NPs, we suffer from this because of four main issues. First of which is that we tend to be high achievers. So by nature, we have high expectations that we place upon ourselves. Numbers two and three kind of go hand in hand, so I'm gonna lump them together, and that is inadequate training and onboarding. Now, this is my opinion, but I personally do not feel that we are very well prepared for this role. So listen, don't come at me with the offensive nature of this statement. It is simply my opinion, okay? I feel like it's impossible to learn what a physician does within our training models. Not that we're expected to, we're not going into the workforce to become physicians. We should not replace them, we are extenders. But we are learning to practice similar to them and we haven't really been taught that in nursing school. So we're condensing the study of medicine down to a narrow sliver of what they learn and focusing on one aspect of it and that's how we can kind of narrow the scope. But even still, two to three years is just not enough time, I think, to know and learn all of the things. When you get out of school and start your first job, the expectation is very similar to when you came out of nursing school in that they teach a broad reach of the subjects and expect you to learn the specialty specific stuff on the job. The difference is medical training, number one, involves multiple years of residency, and number two, nursing orientation is long. They have many, many months, and a lot of them now require new grads to complete a six-month or year-long residency. Compare this to those of us becoming new NPs in which the current culture just expects us to come out of school ready to go. 
residencies are not a requirement and if you can find one they're very competitive and hard to get into there's not a lot of them so pair that with the many many workplaces for new MPs that offer not a lot of orientation it's a very short time frame if at all so the problem is compounded maybe not enough training in school and during our rotations followed by not a lot of orientation with a high expectation of being able to come in prepared to do the work it's sort of a difficult place to be in life by the way if you want to learn more about np residencies or fellowships or hear about common orientation structure check out these videos number four there's so much rhetoric out there about nurse practitioners capability to practice that I think there is a societal professional bias that we have to overcome. So we need to prove ourselves more than our colleagues who are doing similar to what we're doing. <laughs> uh, not pointing fingers at anybody, but there's a lot of negative talk about NP. So you may go into it working with people that have some bias against you that has nothing to do with you, your training or your capabilities. So the pressure is on my friends. So how do you know if this is you? Okay, the people who have imposter syndrome tend to be highly self-critical and possess an overachiever mentality. They lack perspective and struggle to realistically assess their competence and skills. And instead, they attribute any success to external factors outside of themselves or luck, if you will. They may have recurrent thoughts of fear that they will not live up to expectations and in fact, may become paralyzed in regards to making decisions or taking action out of fear of error or failure. They may have consistent feelings of self-doubt, anxiety, and this leads to procrastination and can spill over into their home life. I've heard it described as four Ps. People pleasing, so someone who's constantly seeking external validation and approval rather than honoring their own true authenticity. Um, perfectionism, so expecting perfectionism from yourself, leading to paralysis by analysis, and procrastinating difficult tasks, which stems from fear of failure. My guess is if you're watching this, you already know you're in the throes of some wicked imposter syndrome and you don't need me to tell you that you got it. <laughs> so congratulations, admitting you have a problem is the first step. If this is where you're at and you're in a place where you have underestimated how severe this is gonna be, you're letting it get into your head that this, that you can't do this. And this is going to lead to burnout and get, you're just going to feel like you want to give up altogether, go back to bedside or do something out altogether. So my advice to you in this situation is just give it time. Competence and confidence comes in waves, which leads me to my next point, which is answering the question of when, how long did it take for me to feel comfortable in this new role? It came in waves. So let's talk about those different phases of my life. Wave one was around month four-ish. Um, this is when I solved my issues of inefficiency and therefore I started going home on time, finally. The first phase was me staying late at work every day by multiple hours. Um, mostly trying to finish up my notes. And the reason is I tend to get tunnel vision when it comes to learning new skills. And I just have a deep need to fully understand the disease process as well as proper management. So I would research everything that came my way. And I think this is largely a good thing until it leads to burnout. So the right way to do this, if you like myself struggle with memory recall is to capture what you're learning, develop systems, um, and I did this through developing personalized notes called dot phrases, which most EMRs have. Um, I started creating two dot phrases for every problem that I encountered. One was very detailed and basically kept all my tips, links to articles and evidence um, like guidelines, um, all of the stuff I needed to approach the diagnosis development and disease management, all there right there on the computer so that I didn't have to go back to my office and look through files. Um, so I could quickly refresh my memory without having to dig through stuff. The second dot phrase was a copy paste template that I linked into the note each time I encountered this said problem. And I could very quickly just edit it to include the specific like data points for that patient. So note writing went from like hours per patient to minutes. If you're curious about the other tools that I found helpful, particularly when I started my job, here's a video you can check out where I discuss what's in my nurse practitioner bag.
Wave two came around like month six, and this is when the anxiety improved. So I didn't go to bed dreading what new stressors I would face the next day because I developed systems and workflows so I knew my resources. Um, this is also the time in which I stopped like white knuckling my drive into the hospital. So I was still overthinking every single dumb thing I said and did every day. Like I went to bed rehashing everything I did wrong and how I could have done it better. So I was not yet comfortable, but it was starting to get better. Wave three was at the end of year one. This is when I felt comfortable. And the best illustration I can equate this to is like the feeling of surviving your first year of parenting for those of you that have kids. You know, it's been a rough year. You, you know there's a whole host of problems still to come, but you now have the track record to prove that it's achievable. So you know when you're standing at your baby's one-year-old birthday party that you spent all this time planning for and you're watching them inhale this smash cake and you have all this pride and like nostalgia at what, you, what this little being has become. You're not entirely sure how you got them here, how they survived, how you survived, and it was a rough, rude awakening but you both made it. And now you see how bad it can be, you powered through it and you've learned so very much. So you can now go forward knowing that you can handle whatever comes next because you've shown that you can do that. And this is comfort. It's that deep sigh of, okay, okay, we can do this, we can do this. I have done it, so I can do it and it will get better. Wave four happened somewhere between years two and three and this is when I developed confidence. So at this point I had seen most all the problems, I knew how to treat them, I was confident that I could handle 95% of what came in the door and the rest, I knew where to find the resources to handle them. I found that when I read articles they made sense and then at that point we're just mostly becoming a review or an update of new evidence, new guidelines. For you this may be completely different. Your specialty, your orientation process, the amount of time you trained with this team prior to hiring, all of these factors impact your unique trajectory. But the answer to the unspoken question, which is when will you feel competent and confident, is always, always, always. The rate of your growth is directly tied to the time and the quality of effort that you put into your growth. You're going to get out of your knowledge growth what you put into it, my friends. So with this understanding, let's move on to discussing what you can do to ease the pain of imposter syndrome. You have to deeply understand and accept that this is just a temporary place of discomfort. The anxiety or depression that you may be feeling is situational and it will slowly improve as you develop your skills. This will not last, my friends. It will get better. Secondly, Take heart in recognizing that even if no one talks about it or possibly even outright denies it, every single nurse practitioner was new at some point and experienced some degree of imposter syndrome. Knowing that colleagues that you admire and emulate were once you, kind of, it just lessens the blow a little bit. I also think bringing awareness to the negative thoughts that you're having and identifying that imposter syndrome is the cause of them helps to kind of like isolate the feelings and helps you to compartmentalize them. So put it in a bucket. Don't allow these feelings to derail your work day. You still have to, a job to do, so you need to stop procrastinating. No decision is a decision. Allow space and time to feel the stress when it's appropriate. You can't like compartmentalize forever. You can't just keep kicking the can down the road. You know, continuously repressing things or developing unhealthy coping strategies just delays or transfers the problem and honestly can create more of a collateral damage effect. So you gotta walk through the muck before you can get to the other side. So develop a time and a place and a space to deal with all of these negative feelings that you're having. Take it one step at a time, friends. Make the space for forgiveness and grace. If you're in a situation where other people are contributing to your feelings of unworthiness, it's important to note a few things here, friends. Um, in my opinion, people who offer feedback have one of two motives. One, they want to refine your practice. And this is a good thing, okay? If they didn't care about you, they wouldn't push you. So emotional intelligence on your part looks like someone who can take this advisement as the constructive feedback it is and use it for growth rather than receiving it as just criticism. 
You know, learning means that you will hear about everything that you have done wrong all day long. That's the process of learning. Someone has to tell you what you're doing wrong. Okay, here's an example of that. My daughter will sometimes say, someone was yelling at her. She's 12. I can promise you that nine out of 10 times they were not actually yelling at her, but she heard the negative comments or things she didn't want to hear about herself and it did not emote good feelings. So she perceived it as someone is yelling at me. Nobody wants to hear that they're doing a poor job, but the wise learner realizes that this is a necessary step for growth. You have to hear what you're doing wrong in order to learn, adapt and develop strength. So, Learn to get comfortable with hearing about everything that you're doing wrong and take it for the constructive criticism that it is, okay? Develop a thick skin, that's what I'm telling you. The second camp of people who offer constructive criticism slash uh, constant negative feedback um, comes from a more like pathological place. Um, I think that some people just have their own internal challenges that they're facing and y you know, some of the comments they make can go beyond the typical training type of feedback and become intentionally hurtful. When people are just being mean because they're trying to hurt you because hurt people hurt, keep that apart from your feelings about yourself because this is a reflection about them and what they're going through and not you. You know, if someone tells you that you're nothing, let it roll off your back like water on a duck. Return to your core, your true self, and know that you are perfectly made and designed and you have great capacity for growth. Just because someone believes or says something negative about you does not make it true. So try not to spend too much time in this place of negative um, self-talk and use it for growth and move on. So back to what you can do to ease the pain of imposter syndrome. That first statement I made early on about the quality and the time that you spend on your education, this is what I'm gonna talk about. Um, you have to know that your education does not end with your diploma. You're gonna spend a good deal of time as a new grad NP learning, and it's gonna be mostly self-taught. My tip is to take it one subject at a time and teach yourself the heck out of it. Day one, you deal with a patient dying of septic shock. You go home and you spend the next week the next entire week focusing on the etiology, diagnosis, treatment, guidelines, latest evidence, find resources, bookmark them, put them in your EMRs, adopt phrase for easy reference, make a cheat sheet, ask mentors, get advice, literally teach yourself everything there is to know about this one subject. Now, other issues, they're gonna arise at work, that's fine, just fix them to the best of your ability, seek help, and move on. Your focus should remain on septic shock for the week. When you, if you have ADHD like I do and you go in a million different directions, you never learn anything very well when you're constantly scattered and doing like this, which is easy to do in a high stakes environment because you've got to respond to questions very quickly. Next week, you pick a new problem and you rinse and repeat this process. And what you'll find is that the next septic patient that you encounter will be so much easier to sort out. And at the end of a certain time frame, you're gonna study every single subject that you're basically gonna encounter, okay? It's not gonna be 100% of it, but it's gonna be a lot of it. The next thing I want you to do is find yourself a mentor. Someone you look at and think, I wanna be like them. Ask them to become a formal mentor. If it's a work friend, don't just sit around at work and discuss fears and frustrations. Make a formal request. Would you consider becoming a mentor? I'm struggling with the transition phase and I could benefit from some of your wisdom. How would you feel about meeting two times a month for coffee or whatever proposed arrangement you think would work out well for y'all? Um, and in that time frame, could I ask you specific questions? And be specific, y'all. Most people wanna help, but you gotta make it easy for them. Help me help you. So identify your pain points, your learning style, and let them know. It would be helpful to me if we could sit down and review my hardest case or two and talk about ways in which I could have done better. This is gonna be far more valuable to you than the typical feedback that people will offer when you ask, how am I doing? Which is, you're right where you're supposed to be. I mean, that's nice and I appreciate that, but it's not giving me what I need to grow and get better. So ask them for specificity. I also suggest you join a local or online group of new nurse practitioners, go to meetings. Find people and see if folks are interested in monthly meetups. Surround yourself with peers in your specific phase of life and this is profoundly helpful. 
If I had it to do all over again, here's what I would change. Make dot phrases on day one. Day one, focus on one problem per week. Arm myself with more support. I would find a mentor or other support groups. I did not do that and I wish that I had earlier in my career. Um, I would also use negative talk from others to fuel my passion for growth rather than for self abuse, which is where I let it put me for a long time. Um, and the last thing is that I would allow self grace in knowing that this burden weighs heavily on providers of all skill level. This is human life and the capacity for errors is always, always going to be present. If you are seeking a mentor, I do offer these services um, either on a consultation basis or ongoing um, tutoring type of support. For some, this looks like professional advice and emotional support. For others, this looks like ICU-specific education via tutoring or membership in the acute care lab where I teach um, inpatient acute care specific type of topics. Links will be in the description below if you're interested in that. Yes, my friends, this takes time. It takes a lot of time. Learning the world of medicine as a nurse practitioner with focused and fast education relies on a background that's heavy in bedside experience. Your time to competency and confidence is going to depend on how extensive your background and education were, but more importantly, how well you focus on development. The time it takes to develop confidence will be unique to your career experience. Give yourself patience, kindness, and acceptance, and walk, just walk through the hard one step at a time. Remember, it's supposed to be hard, otherwise everybody would do it. So just use your fear to your advantage and make yourself stronger and wiser, and I promise you, you will get there, my friend. Just, you'll be fine. Hey friends, are you a brand new NP or perhaps you're in school doing an ICU rotation? Are you drowning in the vat of information overload and struggling to make sense of it all? I got news for you, we have all been there my friend. Your rate of growth is directly tied to how much time you spend on education along with exposure to a broad range of problems that we commonly see. I developed this program called the Acute Care Lab Membership to help flatten out the learning curve for novice critical care providers. It is ideal for a hospital-based APP who stabilizes or manages decompensating patients like hospitalists, ICU providers, acute care students who are in school, even ICU nurses, especially those who work in critical access hospital with minimal provider oversight, or those that really just want to raise the bar and go deeper into understanding the pathophysiology and management of critical patients. This is a program designed with two monthly lectures on concepts like vents, drips, interpreting ABGs, how to prevent peri-intubation cardiac arrest, and so forth. My educational approach is heavily based on the foundation of understanding the why over the how. So it always begins with a review of the pathophysiology, followed by assessment tips, development of differentials, and establishment of a plan of care, teaching you action-oriented, evidence-based care. These lectures are presented live because I really believe that interaction with live Q&A is the most beneficial for your learning. However, I understand that most people are not able to do that at all times. So membership here will give you unlimited access to all of the recorded lectures that you can view on demand whenever it's convenient for you. You'll have access to a plethora of written documents to help you as well. Keynote slides, PDF documents I've created, templates. The membership is full of additional resources and comes with all of the perks that you see here. If you have interest in this, please go check out the website, brienp.com, and find out if this is right for you. Thanks for watching all my videos and all the support, friends.